Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on Season 5, Episode 20, Ferengi Love Songs. This episode aired April 21st, 1997. Before we talk about this one, anything to say about last week's episode? No, it was perfect. We just talked about it yesterday. Yes, we are recording two days in a row. Ties of blood and water. Yeah, that was a very dramatic one. And this one, uh, not so much. (laughs) No, that one was tough. Kira, who'd seen so much death, had such a problem with the mortality of those close to her. It was an interesting contrast, I think. Yeah, and I don't know, brought up some dark memories. So. Maybe a lighthearted one would have been a good idea. If only (laughs) it hadn't been Ferengi. (laughs) But anyway. Yes. So should we move on to today's episode? Yes. And as it's a Ferengi episode, I will be doing the walkthrough. Well, it takes a long time to do the notes for each episode because we agreed that's the way we were going to do it, is we were going to walk through each scene. And so I'm the one who usually spends the most time taking the notes. And it didn't take long into the episode before I realized what I don't want to do is spend two hours with this stupid Ferengi nonsense again. So I volunteered to completely skip the episode. <laughs> but, <laughs> but James said, no, no, I'll do it. So here we are. Yes. So I leave it to you. Thank you. So let's get into the episode. Yeah. We start with Quark standing outside his bar, which is closed. And there appears to be fighting going on inside. Mm. Dax approaches and asks who's winning the war. And we find out that it's a vole infestation. One that's been taking three days to clear up. We also learn that apparently the voles are very fast breeders. As Miles had initially thought they were all gone from the station. However, I wonder here, are they also coming in from the ships that dock? I suppose that's how it would happen. They would be like rats on cargo ships. Yeah. But I assume that Ducat and Weyun brought them with last time. Because it's just last week they were on the station. Right. And you know those two are petty enough to bring a couple of voles in a bag and just let them out. Totally. Yep, yep, I'm with you there. That's that's some good head counting, Kim. That's where the voles came from. Thank you. Well, Dax tells him that it'll be over soon and he can get back to his life. But Quark tells her the problem is that he hates his life. He's so whiny in this scene. Oh yeah. Yeah, and he hates his life. Well, then what are you doing to improve it? I know, right? I, the best advice Dax could give at this point, I think, is to advise Quark that perhaps he should change his narrow-minded little life so he's not so unhappy. Yeah, but no. Why would we do that? Because I knew how to be happy. It was arguably at the expense of everyone else, but he at least knew how to be happy. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, I, Dax knows how to be happy. That's true. Yeah. So Quark is in his quarters, moping, and Rom comes in to see him with good news and announces that he and Lita are getting married. Quark replies with, I wish I was dead and I don't want to live anymore. It's so awful. What would worry me at this point is I think you should probably be advising him to talk to a counselor. This is, is this borderline with being suicidal? Well, but Quark is always so melodramatic. Ah, Okay, that's true. He is. So maybe it's not so worrying. He's melodramatic and he's always very focused on himself, which they joke about in this episode, but is very true. Yeah. So, yeah, he's just being whiny. Well, Rom tells Quark that he needs to talk to someone and it's a person who's always been there for him. That's Rom. I think we all know who he means here. Yeah. The one note that I took here now that we've met Chase Masterson in person and realized how not tall she is. It's funny to see how she sort of towers over everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes. At least the Ferengi. She's much taller than they are. Yeah. But that, she's not terribly tall. She wasn't taller than I am. You were about the same height. Mm. Clearly not very tall, yeah. But anyway. We now cut to a very rainy Ferenginar, and Quark is going to see his mother. And he actually hugs her and seems pleased to see her. And we go into the opening credits. Mm-hmm. I think we all know that Rom is really Moogie's favorite. Rom should be her favorite. Quark is terrible to her. That is true, yes. <laughs> she actually seems to like Rom, whereas Quark, not so much. Yeah. 
Well, they're probably a, a little bit more alike than she is with Rome. Oh, that's true. There's a new actress now playing Ishka. The first time we saw her, it was actually Andrea Martin. Yeah. But this is a different actress. I looked her up. Her name is Cecile Adams. And by the way, she's actually nine years younger <laughs> <laughs> than the person <laughs> who she's playing the mother of. I thought that was quite yeah. funny. But also, this actress died quite young of lung cancer. Oh, wow. I was surprised to see that. Yeah, I didn't know that. We're now in the replimat, and Rom is talking to Dax and Miles. And if you notice, he's wearing a Bajoran earring. Double size <laughs> for his big ears. <laughs> yes, it is quite large. He's also quoting the Bajoran prophecies and says he's learning them for Lita as she wants a traditional Bajoran wedding. So he really seems to be getting into Bajoran tradition. And he's talked before about that, that he's really enjoyed listening to Lita tell the stories or at least talk about the prophecies. That's true. Yeah. And so he's always had an interest in those stories, I think, um, in addition to just his general interest in Lita. Yes, we have seen that. Miles picks on Rom a little here, asking if Lita is going to be a traditional Ferengi woman. Why should she be more of a traditional Ferengi woman when they treat the Ferengi women like dirt? Well, Dax replies with, that's not very likely. So <laughs> Dax is pretty cognizant of this, at least. Miles says, Rom is not your traditional Ferengi male, which I think is true because we have seen Rom evolving since the start of the show, which is definitely not a bad thing, him being a non-traditional Ferengi. But Dax here does an incredibly bad job. As she says, he's the least Ferengi yes. Ferengi she's ever met, which does seem to sting Rom a little. Hashtag bad friends, these two. <laughs> They're really not helping. They're undermining his confidence in his relationship and his decisions. And I was very disappointed in those two. And yes, like you said, undermining him. A way better way she could have put this yeah. is to say that He's the least close-minded and shackled by bigoted tradition Ferengi she's ever known. Then you're putting everything he's doing in a positive light compared to other Ferengi, not a, oh, you're not a real Ferengi. Well, why not say something like, oh, you're the most evolved Ferengi I've met, or some, like you said, a positive spin, make him feel good about the fact that he's not stuck in these old ways where women are treated yeah. so badly. Instead, you like insult him by saying, oh, you're not Ferengi enough. Yes. It's so racist. I said this last week. We have this casual racism in Star Trek and here it is again. It was almost like criticizing him for not being the stereotype yes. Ferengi. Yeah. I always think about when... People share something with me, like when they share big decisions that they've made. And I can think of an example of where a friend of mine was showing me some work that she had done in her house. This was a long time ago before we even lived yeah. in California. It was so long ago. And it had cost her a lot and they had worked really hard on it. And she'd had a few people criticize it and just say, oh, I wouldn't have picked that color or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I remember in that moment, all I could think was, what kind of a friend would do that to you? Yeah. Undermine a decision that's already made, money right. you've already spent. You know, why would I stand there and say, well, I would have picked something else? And it doesn't even really matter what my opinion of it is. I thought it looked right. great, and I told her I thought it looked great. But no matter what, be supportive of people. I just felt like this was so terrible of them to do this to him. That's why I said yeah. when, when you walked by and I was watching it, I'm like, this is all Dax's fault. I can't, <laughs> I can't believe she did that. It is. Be supportive. Rom is really trying to be more. And we've seen this certainly most in the last two seasons of he's trying to yeah. become more of a, an individual and not be shackled by the past. That's something you should be absolutely positively reinforcing. And he idolizes Miles. Yes. Yes. That is a lot of power to have over another person. And you got to use that right. power wisely. I feel I could quote the movie line now, but it would be very, very cliched. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> anyway, we got stuck on this scene, but it was annoying. Yes, I think we've safely beaten that scene to death. Yeah. And moving on. Back on Ferengana, Quark is whining to his mum because yeah. he doesn't have a business license. And, mm -hmm. and this is another one of those things. Of, so the only people you can do business with are other Ferengi. I guess if everyone else looks at the Ferengi as utterly untrustworthy and you shouldn't do any business with them because otherwise you're going to get screwed over. 
-hmm. I suppose that would make sense because Quark can't find anyone who would do any business with him. Yeah. If you can't do business with the people who all they want to do is rip you off, boy, that's bad. That's terrible. (laughs) I feel so bad for you. This Ferengi nonsense, I don't understand why people like it. It's so stupid. It doesn't hold up if you sit and scrutinize it. I wonder if people are stuck in what they felt about the show in the past or something. Oh. But this part of Deep Space Nine does not hold up. Quark also continues to complain about his mother not following cultural norms, and Mm. they get into a little bit of an argument about that. Of course, he's naturally, generally unthankful towards her as well. Yes. But she does let him stay with her. So Quark goes to his room, opens his closet, and discovers inside the closet is the Grand Nagus and Mahedu. (laughs) Why were they in the closet? (laughs) (laughs) They were hiding. Okay. (laughs) And also, why are all the doorways so much shorter than the short Ferengi? Yeah, that's a very good question, because having a shorter doorway, wouldn't that require more like drywall and building material to make the shorter doorway? To make it shorter. (laughs) So it would be more expensive? Yes. Nobody can just walk under those doorways, not even these short guys. So it just makes no sense. And poor Mahai, what's his name? Maherdu. Maherdu. That poor guy, he has to practically crawl on the floor to get under them because he's <laughs> double the size of Armin Shimmerman. Yes. Well, Quark is about to leave and stops and asks, why is the Nagus in my closet? <laughs> Good question. And his mother calls out, Zeki, you might as well come out. Quark is shocked by the use of the name Zeki for Grand Nagus Zek and is very confused with what's going on. Yeah. He assumes Mugi is in some kind of trouble, but the Nagus puts his arm around Mugi and says, it's quite simple, really. Your mother and I are in love. Mm. And she hugs the Nagus too, and they both seem quite happy. It was a safe assumption that she was in trouble, but I'm glad <laughs> that's not what it was. So the Nagus and the Mugi now tell Quark the story of how they met at a Tongo tournament. When he found out she was a female, he nearly had a stroke. But they've been seeing each other ever since. And of course, nobody knows about this. They do seem very in love. Yeah. I will say that. So why can't he have a girlfriend? What's Why does it have to be so secret? Is it just because it's Quark's mother? I don't know. They never really addressed why. Hmm. Just it was a female? I I don't know. It's (laughs) it's odd. (sighs) Then have a boyfriend. Yes. And you also see that Obviously, the Nagus is prepared to break the norms of their narrow-minded society when it comes to his own love and happiness. Yeah, funny how that works. Yeah. The hypocrisy. Meanwhile, Quark is rejecting Pell based on the societal norms. Mm. I guess the rich and powerful get to live their own lives how they want. And also the Nagus threatened Pell and Quark both with jail time. Right. Oh, well. Mm-hmm. Quark is incredulous at all of this, but tells his mother he couldn't be happier for all of us. So you immediately know yeah. he's looking at an angle on this. He yeah. wants to get something, probably his license back. Yeah. He's very transparent. Yeah. Back on the station, Miles says they've taken care of all the vols, and Rom comes to talk to Miles about what appears to be a Ferengi prenup agreement that says Lita can't own any profit or property, and that she needs to sign it, or the wedding is off. Mars advises Rom that this is a really terrible idea, and Rom says, he's a Ferengi, it's what they do. So, as you said, it's all Dax's fault. (laughs) But also, he doesn't try to explain it to him about why maybe that's not a more enlightened approach towards a relationship and marriage, or why that's not the way it works in his marriage or in his cultural norms. He doesn't do anything except, oh, this is a stupid idea. I just just don't think they're trying to help. They should be trying to help him. I wonder if in Mars's case, I will make an excuse for him. If human society at that point had moved beyond the acquisition of wealth and property, then this might be something of an alien idea to Miles that mm, yeah. it doesn't mean the same kind of thing that he would just say, well, it doesn't seem like a good idea. It doesn't have the same impact. I guess that's possible. It doesn't make sense with Dax, but right. maybe with Miles. But he said this is a bad idea. Why not at least try to explain why it's a bad idea? Yeah, that's true. He could have expanded upon that and said, yeah, because she's not your property, dude. And Lita later says something about sharing in a marriage and being equals. And Miles yeah. could have easily said something like that. Yeah. We then cut to Lita telling Rom he's crazy and she won't sign it. Yeah, shocker. Rom, of course, 
acts like an idiot, gets upset, and says that she is only after his money and the marriage is off. Lita responds with, you bet it is, and storms out. Mm-hmm. I believe that would be an appropriate response. Yeah, that's a good response. On Ferenginar, Quark is having dinner with his mother and Zek, and Quark is really sucking up to the Nagus. He's doing a really good job here. <laughs> yeah, very Quark. And of course, as Quark is so transparent, the yeah. Nagus immediately says, forget it, Quark, I'm not going to reverse the FCA's decision. You may not like the character, but Wallace Shawn just really does a great job. Yeah. And in a final insult, Quark's mother sides with the Nagus on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's like, eh, he's got a good point, Quark. Well, Quark goes to his room and we hear a transporter sound. And in Quark's closet, we now see Brunt, FCA. Back in the closet. So Jeffrey Combs is getting in on two episodes in a row. Yeah, that's right. He was in last week's episode as Wayun. Brunt now tells Quark he knows all about the Nagus and Moogie and is a very opposed to the whole thing. He wants Quark to split them up. And if he does, he'll get his license back. And being an idiot, Quark agrees. <laughs> yeah. It looks like the next day, but Quark goes to see the Nagus to spread a rumor that Mugi has amassed a fortune and intends to use it to support equal rights for females on Ferenginar, and also to sow seeds of doubt that she has an ulterior motive in her relationship with the Nagus. The Nagus, of course, listens to all of this quite intently and starts having doubts. Back at home, Quark manages to convince Mugi to agree to talking to the Nagus about his FCA ban. I will say, how can she not see through Quark? He is so transparent. Yeah, in this scene, he's like holding a phaser to his head, pretending he's going to commit suicide, which again, suicide, how funny. I thought he was trying to clean his ears. I thought he was threatening suicide because oh. he waited till she came in and then he quick put it in his ear. Really? That was a phaser? I thought it was. Oh. What else is he putting in his ear? And he waited until she came in and he dramatically yeah. put it up there. Oh, wow. Yeah. I thought he was threatening to kill himself, but of course, she doesn't even buy into it. That's a laugh a minute in this episode. Oh, yeah. Let's see. What are all the funny things in this episode? <laughs> <laughs> Racism, sexism, suicide. And we've got one more to come. Depression. Don't forget depression. Always a good laugh in that one. Oh, depression. Yeah, very funny. Wow. And there's one more bad one yet to come. Could this episode honestly be any more insensitive if you tried? I mean, probably, but it's hard to imagine. Oh, there is actually one more Ferengi episode that manages to get an 11 on the 1 to 10 scale for insensitive. So anyway, we'll carry on. Mm. We're doing it for you, listeners. <laughs> Definitely not doing it for me. So we go back to Deep Space Nine, and we do actually have a funny interlude with Cisco and Odo and Worf discussing how General Martog is in a holding cell because he threw one of his men off the second <laughs> level of the promenade. And Worf defends this, saying it was a disciplinary measure. And besides, Kratok was not injured. He was barely shaken up. <laughs> yeah, he was fine. <laughs> so obviously that's something of a standard Klingon operating procedure. Mm. Well, Cisco puts his foot down and says, this isn't a Klingon station. He can't do that. And orders Odo to free Martog. Odo and Cisco then hear a sobbing sound and find Rom working, but also sobbing. <laughs> he tells them he's fine, very unconvincingly, and says, these are tears of joy. To which Odo tells Cisco that the wedding with Lita is off. Yeah. Meanwhile, Lita is walking with Kira and telling her why splitting up with Rom and not getting married is the best thing she can do and how she's happy now he's out of her life. And Kira is disagreeing with everything she says. I don't think you want to talk to Kira <laughs> if you want someone to tell you what you want to hear. You're going to get the truth out of her regardless. And she's not going to sugarcoat it. Yeah. Because in the end, she tells Lita, this is why I know you still love him. On Ferenginar, Quark comes home to find Moogie crying. It appears Quark's terrible plan has worked and the Moogie and the Nagus are split up. She says, it's a disaster for all of us. So there's a foreshadowing of something there. Yep. Well, Quark calls Brunt, who says his license is restored. Congratulations. Now, wouldn't his mother figure something was up if all of a sudden Quark's license was reinstated? I mean, she's not as dumb as Quark. Yeah, but he never looks more than one minute into the future. So he's not even thinking about the fact that everybody's going to know. That's true. I think he's hoping that now the Nagus and his mother will never speak again. But that's unrealistic, too. Yeah, right. 
Yeah, she could always send him another letter. Yeah. Next morning, Quark is planning to return to Deep Space Nine, and the Nagus calls, telling him to come to the Tower of Commerce right away. He calls Quark Rom, which is another hint that perhaps something is a little up here. All oh, right. And the Nagus asks Quark to be his first clerk, but he cannot remember the access code for his data pad. So we're seeing this is a problem here. The Nagus is starting to experience quite severe memory loss. He can't remember the numbers, and he can't remember the names of people they were just talking about. Yeah. Back on the station, Miles has come to Rom's quarters to get a tool that he'd loaned him. Rom is sitting with two piles of latinum. He has a traditionally bad Ferengi plan of <laughs> bribing Lita to sign the prenup. That is totally Ferengi. That is ridiculously stupid. So that's actually a pretty good Ferengi plan. Miles asks Rom, do you want her back or not? He says he'd give anything. And Miles waves a piece of latinum at Rom. Kind of to reinforce the point. I think at the beginning, when he's first talking about Lita signing the document or the prenup or whatever, Rom says something about how if the marriage ended, she would be agreeing to give up all claim to his profits and his money. Yes. But then later, like Miles says, well, this doesn't make sense. If you gave her half of your money now, then she'd have to give it back to you anyway and she because she right. can't own anything. And that's not what he said the agreement meant at the beginning. This is, to me, almost like the agreement is saying, well, now you are a Ferengi woman. Right. And you have no rights just like the Ferengi woman. But that's not what Ram said at the beginning. So even through their sort of goofiness here, they're not consistent. And oh. it, it's, it's yeah. hard for me to even understand what... What is that agreement that he's asking her to sign? If it is really just to give up claim to his profits that he made on his own, yeah, okay, that doesn't seem unfair. But if what she's signing is she has to give up all of her money as well and claim to yeah. anything and she becomes destitute, can't wear clothes, can't make any of her own decisions, can't work. Well, now it's a completely different thing, but they're not very clear. That's true. They never really covered, is this mm -mm. a full, you're going to be a Ferengi wife? aka property, or is this just a, you don't get access to my finances if they split up? And by the way, the only one of the two of them that has a job is Lita. I mean, Ram has a job, but I assume it's not a paying job. That I don't think has been covered, but it does kind of hint at that at the end. Yeah. On the promenade, we now get a shot of Morn eating a jum jar stick, and it appears <laughs> Lita is now running a jum jar stand. <laughs> She's got some side jobs. Yeah, yeah. She seems like a better businesswoman than Rom is a business Ferengi. Yeah. Well, Rom has come to see her, and he tells her he wants to marry her, and he's given away all his profit to Kira for the Bajoran Children's Fund. Yeah. She asks if he did this for her, and he replies, he did it for us. So I think maybe he's starting to get things. Maybe. He's starting to learn something here. Not with Dax or Miles' help. No. Maybe with Kira's help. <laughs> Maybe she gave them some good advice. That would be good. Yeah. She wouldn't sugarcoat anything. Rom and Lita kiss as Mars and Julian are watching from the promenade. And Julian says, well done, Chief. Or should I call you Cupid? <laughs> it's probably good that Quark has been gone during this entire episode because he surely would have caused trouble for Rom in all of this. Yes, Rom might have talked to him and ended up with even worse advice. He would have lost his money and his girlfriend. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I liked the scene. I thought it was pretty cute. You had you had Miles fixing the catastrophe Dax had caused. You also had Rom actually learning the worth of a good relationship. Mm -hmm. Although I am somewhat worried about Julian still stalking Lita. That does seem <laughs> a little bit of a problem. Maybe. Because, yeah, what were they actually <laughs> doing? On the second floor, looking down on them. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> yeah. And we just saw that earlier with Dr. Bashir, I presume, where he was in the bar stalking Lita. Oh, right. They were also up on the second level looking down onto her. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. a good point. Looking down on her brains from above, <laughs> to quote Quark. Back on Ferengana, Quark is returning home from his first day as being the Nagus's clerk. And the exchanges are down. The economy is <laughs> in free fall. Everything is a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> After one day with Quark, yes. <laughs> the economy's falling apart. Yeah, sounds right. Moogie tells Quark she knows the Nagus's memory is not what it used to be. And suddenly Quark realizes they weren't just lovers. Moogie was actually helping the Nagus run everything. Mm -hmm. And Moogie tells Quark that's exactly what she was doing. Yep. She also realizes Quark was the one who turned the Nagus against her. She tells Quark he may have triggered the destruction of the entire Ferengi economy. 
is that actually a bad thing for the rest of the quadrant? <laughs> Questionable. So I think she's kind of finally figured it all out. Yeah, he gets yet another example of how his mother is just as smart and just as capable as anyone when it comes to financial things. The next day, Quark has come in early and has a table full of data pads and seems to be typing furiously. Brunt comes in to see him and tells him there is an emergency meeting of the Board of Liquidators and the Grand Nagus. Brunt knows about the failing memory and intends to replace him. Grand Nagus Brunt, he says. Yeah. Back home, Moogie is berating Quark, who admits he's been hanging around with humans for too long, and that he has developed a conscience. <laughs> yeah. They both agree there can't be a Grand Nagus Brunt and sit down to form a plan. Yeah, that was interesting because they talked about him... I don't remember the words they used, but they basically said you can't be supremely selfish. Your greed has to reflect the greed of the population, not just yes. of your own individual greed. Though that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I think it was a variation on trickle-down economics. <laughs> yes, it kind of was. We now go to a very jovial Nagus saying how he answered all their questions and how he thought Brunt's head was going to explode at one point. <laughs> yeah. So he has outfoxed all of them. So were we supposed to believe that Quark had advised him? And that's why, or that he just had moments of clarity during that meeting. I assume that what Quark had done had given him a full briefing. So he was prepared. And it was really from Moogie, yeah. Yes, because Moogie has said sometimes it helps if you tell the Nagus two or three times and right. it sinks in. So I think what had happened was he'd briefed the Nagus on everything that was happening. And it basically got him to a point that he was remembering everything. Okay. And probably rubbed his ears because he oh. said that also helped him remember. Yeah, I hope not. Perhaps shockingly, he then admits to Quark he's losing his memory. And he also doesn't miss an opportunity to pick on Quark by calling him Rom and making a very bad joke. Yeah, that was funny. At least the Nagus finds picking on Quark funny. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Well, the Nagus wants Quark to remain his first clerk. But Quark brings in his financial advisor, who gave him all the information that helped the Nagus. And of course, it's Moogie. So once again, we see that basically you can't rely on Quark for financial advice. His mother's <laughs> the only smart one. We also get the Nagus here to agree to go to a Vulcan doctor to look into the memory problems. Yes. They have no appreciation of profit, but they do yeah. make good doctors. Yeah. <laughs> Quark tells the Nagus he lied about his mother, and he spread the false rumors. The Nagus immediately fires Quark and is reconciled with Moogie. So at least there was a good outcome there. And also, she honestly says that she does believe in equality for women, which is the first time anybody has said any such thing, and then the Nagus didn't scream. Yes, he just sort of harumphed He scoffed a little bit, yes. yeah. <laughs> but at least that was something. A little movement. Mm. Back home, Quark is packing to leave, and Brunt teleports into his closet again. He threatens Quark a bit. The usual. Yes. But Quark reminds him the Nagus is now something of an ally. Right. And he pushes Brunt back into the closet with a very deflated Brunt saying, it's not over. And we close with Quark playing with some action figures that Moogie saved for him. Yeah. Quark and his dolls. The end. Well, I expect you have a lot of over analysis to talk about, Kim, so I will keep mine fairly short this time. <laughs> uh huh. I think my first piece of analysis here is there should be times when Dax's friends just shout shut up at her constantly <laughs> until she stops speaking. <laughs> stop talking. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be sensitive to who you're talking to and be yes. sensitive that your joke or your lighthearted comment might be taken the wrong way by someone who doesn't have the same cultural background as you yes or the same grasp of whatever it is that you're talking about so it was really insensitive of both her and miles although she admittedly was the worst in that that one particular yeah. scene but it was just so insensitive of them to not realize that, especially with the hero worshiping and the way that Ram has worked really hard to fit in. And he he tr like that one episode where he was trying all the different foods just because Miles liked it or because the people on his right, team the liked breakfasts, it. Yeah. It's like be sensitive to that. Help him make good decisions. You don't have to tell him what to decide. But if you make jokes about it and you make light of it, he's going to take it the wrong way. 
It was just it's kind of heartbreaking to watch. Especially with someone who is bucking the societal norms, regressive yes. societal norms. Yes, he's And all, is trying yeah. to be something better. He's already put himself out there. Exactly, yeah. You want to encourage that as a, as a positive. It's sort of like if you know a person who has been trying to dress the way that the cultural norms or maybe their parents have told them to, and then they finally get to a point where, okay, I'm going to do what I want to do. Yeah. And they wear something that maybe is different from the rest of what the people around them have said was normal. But now they wear what they're comfortable in. And then they step out. And then you walk up as their friend and make a joke. Oh, That would yeah. be wildly inappropriate in that moment. You're undermining that person's decision to just be themselves and to be the thing that they really want to be, not the thing that other people have told them to be. Right, right. It, it, it just it would make that person's insides collapse. You just yeah. can't do stuff like that. Be better people. <laughs> Which is kind of the irony here of they're supposed to be more evolved. Yes, exactly. Wouldn't you have more empathy for Rom in this situation? Again, this is why this Ferengi humor isn't funny. It is the opposite of what we should be watching as part or the way that we should be acting as part of Starfleet and as part of the Federation. Yeah, I would agree with that. And my second overanalysis point is why wouldn't Mugi tell Quark that her involvement with the Nagus wasn't just romantic, there was more to it, that he had this problem, that she was helping, and that if she didn't, there's the potential that the Ferengi economy could collapse and all the problems that would cause. It seemed like keeping that a secret ended up causing more of a problem than if Quark knew. Well, I think there's a couple of reasons why she maybe kept it to herself. One is in a relationship, things between couples are not necessarily other people's business. And she probably just felt like she was doing the right thing for him, for someone that she loved. That's a possibility. Yeah. That she was protecting him. Not saying it was the right thing, but that may have been one of the reasons. Protecting the Nagus. Yeah. Yes. It's also possible that she is used to keeping secrets because she has oh, been doing that for quite gosh. a long time. She's right. been keeping the part of herself that was able to make money and was smarter than the men. So it's a norm for her, the normal yeah. behavior. You wouldn't naturally volunteer any of that. Right. And a third possible reason is that she thought Quark might use it against him to get his license back. He might do something stupid. Quark is known to do something stupid. Totally. That's a very good point. He might try and use it as leverage. Yeah, those are all good reasons. And I think that wraps up my extended over analysis. <laughs> I don't have much. I mean, <laughs> I was, I brought it up before. I was very confused about the rules of that prenup or whatever that agreement was. I just think they weren't clear if they were trying to make it yeah. so important. They at least should have been clear about it. We just didn't really know what it meant or what it was that she was signing. Yeah. It makes very little sense to me that they would try to force a non-Ferengi woman to sign a Ferengi agreement like this because it would seem to me that they wouldn't actually allow or encourage a Ferengi from w marrying a woman that's not a Ferengi. Oh, so I would think, if he yeah. was doing that, my guess is he would already be invalidating himself as a Ferengi and would have gotten kicked out anyway. And so the money nonsense wouldn't have mattered. Right. If you're marrying outside the Ferengi, wouldn't they kick you out? Wouldn't you get an FCA ban? Wouldn't they look down on you? So yeah. it wouldn't necessarily matter. Right. So that was the only thing I had in my overanalysis. So I'll just move to women in the future. And look, I don't, <laughs> I don't need to rehash all the terrible things about what I feel about the way we joke about Ferengi females, because it's not funny. And uh, we already had one entire episode where that's all we talked about. So I'm not going to harp on that. But the fact that no one tries to help Rom see the position he's in from a different point of view. Yeah. No, again, I I've said it so many times. I say it in my life, but I've said it on this podcast. Women need allies. And if nobody is going to try to explain to Ram why Lita feels this way or why she wouldn't want to sign that or why perhaps she wouldn't want to give up being a Bajoran woman and become a Ferengi woman, he's never going to understand. No way to become educated. 
Well, he has no cultural background to understand exactly why yes. that might be a problem. So I I find that really frustrating because yet yeah. again, there's no allies for the women or the females. I understand they're not human women, but they are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have a couple other points of women in the future, but I'm just going to say this is terrible. It's all terrible. The Ferengi <laughs> stuff and the way women are treated and joked about, and it's terrible. We make jokes in this episode at the expense of women. We make jokes in this episode, like you said, about depression. We make jokes about suicide. We make jokes in the end about memory loss and aging. I mean, how many things could we be insensitive to in this one episode? It's a nightmare. Well, they're playing for humor in what could be a serious episode. Yeah, this could have been a good episode. And it feels like they're just poking fun at actual serious issues. Yeah. It's like, ah, oh, man, miss on so many fronts. Yeah, all of our listeners, are they're going to know how we're going to talk about this episode before they start listening to us. So hopefully Probably. we <laughs> didn't disappoint. I mean... What's crazy with this episode is the B story is actually the better story. Yeah. It's better, but it still needs work. Oh, it has its it, holes, but yeah. 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 All right. Well, let's move on to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? I think because of the poor portrayal of depression, mm -hmm. suicide, senility, memory loss, mm -hmm. and oh, what else did I miss in there? Rampant Treatment sexism? Of women. Yeah, uh, I, it's got to be a thumbs down. It's <laughs> it's like if you went out of your way to write something to be offensive without being funny. Yeah. So all I can give it is like a thumbs down. It ages so badly. And let's face it, it ain't funny. Yeah. I mean, what I wrote in my notes under rating is yuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sexism is not funny, especially when there's no amount of irony mixed into it. It's just, yeah. it's not funny. And it's not just the sexism. It's also the humiliation that the the female side of the population is actually a subspecies, not deserving of anything. It's really, yeah. it's revolting is what it is. How to argue with that? All right. Well, I think that wraps up season five, episode 20. So come back next week for episode 21. I have it on good authority. It is not another Ferengi episode. So <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be there. <laughs> we still have the arguably worst Star Trek episode of all time involving Ferengi to come. Oh, no. I thought this was it. Oh, no. This isn't it? No. Oh, are we no. going to skip that one? Are you going to make me watch it? <laughs> I think I'm going to actually watch it with you and see how far you get into it. Oh, my God. Well, I am not looking forward to that, but um, <laughs> I guess it's not next week at the very least. So I have next week's episode to look forward to. I am looking forward to your reaction to that one. Oh, God. <laughs> so much pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you'll like it. Oh, I'm sure. All right, well, let's move on with our lives. <laughs> In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own overanalysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com or tweet us at rebingeit. We're also on Instagram and YouTube at rebingeit. If you want to check us out on talkthroughmedia.com, you can find all of our other Star Trek podcasts there, including the one that we do about Prodigy, but there are other Star Trek podcasts as well. And if you want to support us through Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash Star Trek TTM and all the funds for that Patreon go to supporting all of the podcasts on the Talk Through Media Network. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. 